Hallelujah. What a morning we've had, and we thank God for... Please be seated, please be seated. We thank God for uh, the times we've had to share, to receive uh, from all the speakers, exhortations, words of encouragement. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, to receive from God's people, and to be encouraged. And I just want to acknowledge all the pastors who are here from ICGC, all our senior pastors. God bless you. Can we have some light, please? I've been waiting for it. Amen. Want to acknowledge especially uh, my dear friend, Pastor Kinsley Apiaje, who is here. Uh, with his wife and for all the great pastors who are here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I want to share a bit and uh, go back to what I started on Tuesday. If you were here, if you were not here, I, I don't know what to do about you. But uh, on, on Tuesday, I started talking about roots to fruits. And uh, I'm doing part two of roots to fruits. And I'll go back to the scripture I shared, which is from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 37 and verse number 31. Um, Isaiah uh, was a very significant prophet and spoke to God's people at a very difficult time, and, and, and uh, he spoke to the remnant of God's people, and he said, the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. The remnant shall take root downward and bear fruits upward. So he's talking about doing something downwards, and he calls it roots, and he said, out of that we will bear fruits. And he's talking to people who have been displaced, been dispossessed, and, uh, and, and talks about God's process of restoration. And I believe that the principle that God speaks through Isaiah to the remnant is still relevant for us at various levels. And I'm, I'm going to uh, focus more on pastors and on church leaders. Uh, we, we can apply it to other areas of life, but it's always important uh, that we also know the focus of where our message is. So, in ministry, there is always the roots part and there is the fruit part. The root part is downward. The fruit is upward. The root is hidden. The fruit is revealed. And many times that there is always a public aspect of ministry. And the public aspect is what we see. Uh, and so when, you know, people see me, they see my public ministry, what I'm doing that is revealed. So mostly what I'm doing is I'm showing fruits. When Bishop Bismarck is preaching, he's showing fruits. When a pastor stands before the congregation to preach, he's showing fruits. But the fruit doesn't stand by itself. It emerges from roots. And the roots are the things you do uh, before fruiting. And much of what Bishop Bismarck was sharing about, uh, talking about preparation and all of that, uh, is all about roots. But generally, as human beings, we, we don't like roots. We, we like fruits. We like, we like to be seen, uh, especially pastors and preachers. We like to be seen. We like to demonstrate. We like to manifest we like to express, and, 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 and it's valid to want to express and to be seen, 
But it has to come from somewhere. It has to emerge from somewhere. Um, it's interesting listening to Bishop Bismarck. I, I think we have had uh, pretty similar experiences. I got born again, um, I, th I always say, between 1970 and 1972. Uh, many people know when they got born again, but I got born again in a period. Uh, because between 1970 and 1972, I went for every altar call that was made anywhere, in my church, in Christian groups, in revivals. When they say, come and give your life to Christ, I go forward. I said the sinner's prayer after, more than 40 times. I said it so many times. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as your Lord and personal Savior. I said it many, many times. So somewhere in 1972, I think, I said to myself, I think I've said enough. I think by this time I should be saved. So uh, I concluded that I was born again. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so 1972, I actively became aware that I was born again. I think I got born again probably 1970. But by 1972, I had concluded enough sinner's prayer to guarantee me salvation. And then in 1975, I received the Holy Spirit a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and really got involved uh, in Christian ministry. But when I, when I felt God was calling me, it was probably around uh, uh, at when I was about 14 years old. And uh, I, I just felt I was going to work for God. I was going to do God's work. I, I, I didn't know in what form. And at that time, the, the part of God's work uh, that really uh, appealed to me was to be a monk. I wanted so much to be a monk because I, I loved monks and people who lived in solitude and in quiet places and, and just worshiping God and, 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 and serving God and prayer and contemplation. And so much of my life I desired just to live far away from publicity and live in silence, live, live in quietness and think about important matters and, and pray about them and, and think about the Word of God and, and just live for God. Uh, I never desired for a public ministry. So for those people who knew me in my early Christian life, I mean, if anybody tells you, oh, I knew him uh, when he was young and, and we knew God would use him, I would say he would not be telling the truth. Because I wasn't known. I was always a very quiet person, very contemplative person, always just, just quiet. I mean, I mean, I admired people who do big things for God and preached and all of that, but I never thought myself preaching. I thought I would end up in a monastery, but Charismatics and Pentecostal didn't have a monastery, so I didn't know how I was going to get into one. Uh, but, but eventually, you know, over years, my, my life started having a public form and in, in, the, in the way I preach, and, and, and people thought that I preach well, and so gradually I had a public ministry, and, and up to now, people know me more for my public ministry. But still, my, my, my best space is to be quiet. My best space in life is to be quiet and to be contemplative, uh, so that um, when I start doing something outwardly, uh, it will be fruitful. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is going to go that way. I don't say everybody should see, seek to be a monk. But I, I think that the lesson here is that when all you're seeking is, is to be in the limelight, to be big and, and to preach and to talk to thousands and, and all of that, sometimes you get so persuaded by the big things you want to do that you don't do the necessary things that are required for you to do the big things. Uh, and, and so remember, the last time we spoke, we talked about Jesus Christ and his ministry, and we looked at his ministry in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, uh, uh, when uh, he was with the uh, teachers of the law, and we learned a lot from them. For today, we're going to shift a bit, and we're going to look at David. 
David's ministry was a very public ministry, and his ministry started public very early. Uh, when he was very young, uh, we know about his encounter with Goliath. And, 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 he, and so you, you think, oh, wow, David just appeared on the scene. First Samuel chapter 17 from verse 45 to 47. First Samuel 17, 45 to 47. It's a passage we are familiar with. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, and with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from you. This day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines, the birds of the air, wild beasts of the earth, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not say with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Now, when you hear this, it's impressive, but then the moment you think this is a 17-year-old talking, you wonder, how can a 17-year-old say what he's saying and do what he's doing? Did David just emerge to say these things? Was he just there one day, he gets to the battlefield, and he's saying these bombastic words and doing these magnificent things? He's 17 years old. What has been happening before he's 17 years old? What has he been learning? And a few things I'm going to show you about David from this passage to show you his sense of awareness. Everybody say awareness. There is something that every leader, every pastor should have, and they should have a sense of awareness. They should be aware. They should be somewhere and should be able to notice what is going on there. Be aware of it. And David has a very keen sense of awareness. By the age of 17, he's developed this keen sense of awareness. And I'm wondering, when did he develop it? Probably he's been developing it for a very long time, maybe when he was 12 or 8 or wherever. But by the time he's 17, he has developed a very sharp sense of awareness. And that sense of awareness was what is going to determine all that goes on in, his, uh, in this warfare. The first thing you would note is that he was aware of Goliath's weapon. He's aware of Goliath's weapon. Now remember that Goliath has been going out for 40 days before the people. 40 days, he goes out and says, give me a man, give me a man, give me. And he's been doing it for 40 days. The whole of Israel is scared. David is sent by his father to go to the battlefield. He comes to the battlefield. I'm not sure how long he stays in the battlefield or how close he goes to go Goliath. He's not in the army. So to all intents and purposes, he's not in close proximity to Goliath. Goliath is standing away off on the other side of the valley. Israel is on this side of the valley. David is not the, in the army. Probably he found his way to the front line of the army to observe the guy who is threatening Israel. And then he noticed something. He says to Goliath, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. Exact three weapons. Now, he didn't say you come to me with a shield. He didn't say you come to me with a, a, a helmet. He doesn't even come to me uh, as a giant. But he names the things Goliath has that can do damage. Just by looking at the battle, he knows the thing I have to be aware of is what this guy can do to harm me. His 
helmet cannot harm me. His body cannot harm me. His breastplate cannot harm me. Nothing he has can harm me. But he can harm me with a sword. He can harm me with a spear. He can harm me with a javelin. Can you imagine what it means to go into a battlefield and read the enemy's weapons in a short time? Because a lot of people don't have a sense of awareness. They can be in a place and notice nothing. So much is going on, they notice nothing. You can have a pastor who can be in this Ghana and notice nothing. Live in a community and notice nothing. Even when the enemy is working in his community, he can't tell. But David noticed the guy has a sword. The guy has a spear. The guy has a javelin. A sword is for close combat. In other words, David is saying he has a sword. The only way the sword can get me, no matter his size, is I must be close to him. If I get close to Goliath, I'm done. Because he has a sword. And by this time, nobody in Israel has a sword. Second, he has a spear. The spear can be thrown against me, but the spear can go only 300 feet or 100 meters. So if he throws his spear, I have to be within 300 feet of him or 100 meters of him. If I'm 200 meters out of his range, his sword is useless, his spear is useless, and his javelin is useless. So Mr. Golag, I've figured you out. I know what you have. I know the damage you can cause. So I have to choose my strategy. I'm going to come against you, but I'm going to make sure I come against you in such a way that I'm not going to be in close hand-to-hand combat with you, and I'm not going to be 300 feet in your radius. And if I can stay that way, then Goliath, as powerful as he is, has no power over me. Are you following me? It's called awareness. Somebody say awareness. Because one of the things that a man of God, a woman of God should have is a sense of awareness. You know, sometimes you're dealing with a big problem. But then the problem looks so big that sometimes, like the children of Israel, you bow to the problem. And you ask yourself, Yeah, the problem is big, but what can it do? So you have a church, you don't have money, but what can that do to you? The fact that I'm broke and I don't have money and I, we don't have a PA system and we don't have this and we don't have, yes, I don't have all of that, but what can it do to limit me? Because if you don't have a sense of awareness, you're going to allow problems to limit you when God can give you a strategy over the problems. When we started our church, ICGC, we didn't have a screen like this. Our first church auditorium is less than this screen. It's probably about one-third of the screen. That's, it wasn't an auditorium, it was a classroom. Classroom, I think it was a class four classroom. The chairs were very tiny. We didn't have drums. We didn't have guitar. We didn't have trumpet. And I remember so well, there was another church across this, the classroom, another classroom, and they had trumpets. You know, when you are a young person, all these things mean a lot to you. So you say, they have trumpet, I don't have trumpet. They have guitar, I don't have guitar. They have organ, I don't have drums. They have drums, I don't have drums. The only thing we had was a classroom with tables and chairs. So we decided to beat the tables for drums. 
I'm telling you, I was beating that thing. There was blood all over my hand. Yes, I don't have all of that, but what can it do to stop me? What can it do to stop me? And that's what David is thinking. Goliath has all of that, but what can he do against me? He can only hit me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin. If I stay out of the range of these three, Goliath is useless. As formidable as he looks, he is useless. So he chose his strategy. He chose the weapon he's going to use to neutralize this guy. And that weapon has to be chosen based on how he has assessed the situation. Now, I want you to watch something. Not only was he aware of Goliath's weapon, David was aware of God's decrees. So he is aware of Goliath. He is aware of God. He says, you come to me with a sword, spear, and so and so, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, whom you have defied. It's amazing the words he chose. He didn't say, I come to you in the name of Saul, the king of Israel. That's what he should be saying. He says, I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, and he chose the word whom you have defied. Now, why did he say that? Because he is aware of God. In Leviticus chapter 24, Leviticus 24, verse 15 to 16, Leviticus 24, 15 to 16. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Verse 16. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, and the stranger as well as him who is born in the land, when he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. According to the decree of God, when somebody blasphemes God or defies God, the antidote is stoned. Are you following me? God has said, whether he is a citizen of Israel or a stranger, and Goliath is a stranger. He has blasphemed and defied the Lord. David says the way to deal with Goliath is stone him. Now ask yourself this. How did he know that? How did he know that? So by this time, David knew the law of the Lord. He's been reading the law of Moses. He's memorized it. That's roots. His roots are deep. He's 17, but 17 with deep roots. He understood the provisions of the law to solve the problems facing him. And so he decided According to the law of Moses, if a stranger or a citizen blasphemes God, he must be put to death. But the method by which he'll be put to death is through stoning. And I'm going to go back and implement what God says. So he goes and picks a stone, and he picks a weapon. Now, do you think that this was the first time David was using a sling and a stone? No. No. You can't fight this battle and use try and error. 
This is not the first time. Would it be the second time? No. This is a tried and tested method he has developed. He's been doing it for a very long time. In his 17 years, he has mastered stone throwing to the extent that he could hit a lion and a bear with stone. When a lion came to take one of his animals, he hit the lion. That means David cannot just hit stationary objects, he can move, he can also hit moving objects. And he's been doing it for a very long time, probably from age eight. And he's done it so well. David was not the only stone thrower in Israel. It was part of their skills. That everybody knew how to throw stones. Nobody had figured out that stone throwing, as common as it is, could be more effective against sword and spear. So when they saw sword and spear, they forgot stone throwing. But David never forgot stone throwing because he had to do a combination between his skills and God's word. So when he took that weapon, he had complete advantage over Goliath. According to tradition, a typical sling can be shot 700 feet with pure accuracy. A thousand feet maybe can miss. 700 feet accurate. David, therefore, can be way out of Goliath's range and win. That's why he could talk bombastically. He knew what he had. <laughs> you, know, you know, because sometimes we just feel David is just there talking, I come to you in the name of the Lord, I will strike you today and I will take you. He knew exactly how the battle would end because at that point he knew he had the advantage over Goliath. He had a specialized skill and he has God's word. Just want to talk a little bit about specialized skill. Specialized skill. One of the things that I, I feel God wants each one of us to have is to have a skill that gives us an advantage. That's what David had. A skill that gives us advantage. And for pastors, we must all have a skill that gives us an advantage. One of my sad points dealing with pastors is that I, I think we are so insecure and have a very, very, we have pastors with very low self-esteem that they are all trying to do the same thing. So when you look at most pastors, they are all trying to do the same thing. And you have very few pastors with a specialized skill that gives them an advantage. Almost everybody is trying to do the same thing. So, for example, if I ask you in Ghana, how many pastors do you know who are experts in marriage counseling? I'm not talking that they, they advise people. Because a lot of what people call marriage counseling is advice. 
I've been married so many years, that's what I've learned. And many times we do more damage than good. But to say that this pastor is a marriage counselor, has studied marriage counseling, understands all the processes, you can be sure that when you refer a marriage problem to them, they can professionally deal with it. How many pastors have that? And yet, one of the number one problems in churches is marriage. But the least specialized in is marriage. Because a pastor who is called and has to specialize in marriage counseling wants to be a prophet. Because that's the popular thing. So we have so many copycats of one thing, but very few specialists in areas that would distinguish us. I've told our pastors many times, I said, I'm the general overseer. I'm not a marriage expert. I have a lot of experience in marriage. I've been married for a long time. Based on that, I have experience. But I'm not a marriage counselor. I need pastors in ICGC who understand and know how to do marriage counseling better than myself. So that when somebody comes to me with a problem that is beyond me, I can refer them. But people are not specializing. Only a few people, Dr. Brauco is one of the few who is specialized as a marriage counselor, as a marriage therapist, and has a PhD in that. And he can tell you, I refer a lot of cases to him. Because when the case overs me, I say, <laughs> go to him. He studied the, the, the course. But how come in this church of thousands of people, only one person is a specialist in marriage. The rest are wannabes. We are trying. <laughs> like somebody who advised somebody, when your husband is making you angry, put water in your mouth and keep quiet. So what kind of, is that marriage counseling? So instead of all of you trying to be prophets, can't some of you just decide, I'm going to solve the church's number one problem, families. A lot of church people have teenagers who are wayward. They are on drugs. All we do is deliver them, cast out demons when they pray for them, they roll on the floor and go and take weed. They roll on the floor and go and take weed. They come to church, sing in the choir, and go and take weed. And we're not able to help them. There are no juvenile counselors. Even youth pastors, they want to become prophets. And they meet with the youth and they are prophesying to them instead of solving their drug problems. So we have young people they know church jargon, but they are boozing over the weekend. Because how many youth juvenile counselors are there in the church? When your young person is in trouble, which pastor can you take your son to, your daughter to? Because your daughter is on drugs, your son is on drugs, or they are having sex premarital, they are falling in love with somebody badly, and they can't get over it, and you can't get them to stop the relationship, whom do you talk to? Because all the pastors are following one success model, be a prophet. And if you make a pass, if a pastor wants to be a youth pastor, they are using it as a transition to something else. We don't see the thing like David saw. Everybody is a stone thrower, but David discovered this is what gives me the advantage. That's why of all the army people, he's the one who could take down Goliath. His older brother couldn't, the king couldn't. There are some things I can't do. General Vasia doesn't make you God.
I need to see pastors that you can go to this pastor and say, no, this young guy needs help. Or this woman has a son that is really giving him problems. Can you just take him through a, 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 a process and help them to deal with this problem? You go to the church, nobody has it. Children's church is all transition. When a pastor has made a children's church pastor, he's, he's waiting for something else to do. So we have no specialist in children's church, no specialist in youth ministry, no specialist in drug counseling. Do you know the number of young people who are on drugs? Do you even know the number of pastors who are on drugs? A lot of the prophesying comes from different places. Yeah. There are a lot of psychotists who are prophesying the name of the Lord. They're going to... Woo! That says the Lord. <laughs> and that's why there's a lot of bizarre behavior in the pulpit. They behave in ways and you say, ah, this guy now, nah, is he correct? He's not correct, I'm telling you. He's not correct. But there's no specialist. There's no balm in Gilead. The church is just doing one thing. And people called to specialization have abandoned. When we come, we deal with issues of even things like music. How many pastors are there who have a degree in music, a master's degree in music, PhD in music, in choral music, in contemporary music, in keyboard, and are content with their area of specialization. Even when they train like that, they want to be something else. The reason is because, I said it in part one, they're not able to develop uniqueness and confident in their uniqueness. One of Africa's number one problems is that people just copy. Today's sachet water business, everybody is sachet water. Next time is Uber, everybody is Uber. Yango, everybody was a Yango. Because people are not able to stay in an area of uniqueness. But it is the uniqueness that gives us the advantage. We don't want copycats. I want people that I can trust in. If I need advice on young people, I want a pastor that I can talk to and say, listen, advise me, counsel me, tell me what's going on with the young people. And they say, Pastor, according to the statistics, this is this and that, I've studied this and this is that and this is that. I think we should do this for our youth people. I don't want someone to come and say, I just sense the Holy Spirit says we should do this for you. That one, I can sense it myself. I can sense it. I need your specialization. When it comes to women's ministry, it's all slogan. Women on fire. Women on fire. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know about you, but I don't know any pastor in Ghana who is specialized in women. I don't know one. I know people who lay their hands on women and they fall under the power. But there are menopausal women, there are all kinds of women, and we don't know how to deal with them, and they are in the church. They are full in the church, but nobody is averting ministry to them. And so Goliath stands and defies us. And we are in our camps. Nothing happened. Even the women, they don't understand themselves. 
<laughs> the women, they don't understand themselves. They, themselves. they had the problem walking through the problem, and they don't know how to. <laughs> they don't understand themselves because they haven't specialized in themselves. So, my, my point is saying there are many avenues of ministry open. There are many avenues. Don't be a copycat. Have a strength that Saul can trust a nation to. Have a strength. Have something that we can all come to you and say, you are the one who helps us solve this problem. Pastors, apart from standing before your congregation to minister every Sunday, you must be a cutting edge in your ministry. An area of specialization that builds confidence in all of us to trust you. To look up to you. So, even when it comes to area of theology, people go to Bible school, they study Greek, they, they understand Greek, and instead of using the Greek to help us to understand the scripture, they want to do deliverance. They want to go and prophesy. There are too many prophets. Can't you see the market is over flooded? It's an overflowed market. But because we don't know how to really segment and how to specialize, everybody is going to do the same thing. You know, I, I, I may be biased. I'm very limited in whom I rec recognize as a prophet. I'm very limited. I'm very limited. I mean, this gentleman here, you know. And I'm not saying... He's the only prophet I recognize. There are a few more. But, you know, I've known him from 1978. When nobody was called a prophet. Those days when we used to pray, he would be talking about China developing. That China is going to be a superpower. We didn't even understand what global politics is. But he was prophesying in the 70s. Of course, but he has already taken the market. <laughs> so you two go and find something else to do. <laughs> so I, I may be biased, I may be biased, and may God forgive me, but when a young, I see a young pastor and he comes, I'm prophet so and so, my, I, sh I shut my mind. <laughs> Honestly, then you come, I'm prophet so I switch off. I said, are you crazy? Is that all you can say? Is that all? Is that all the problem you solve in this world? Can't you find something else to do? And don't tell me God called you. You called yourself. The problems of the church are many. There are kids in our churches. They've been abused, sexually abused. And we don't even know how to deal with it. All we do is lay hands on the Father in the name of Jesus. I pray your deliverance upon this son. But they are being sexually molested. You're going to lay hands on them? They are teenagers who are wayward. These days, a lot of Christians marry. Within three years, they are divorcing. Three years they are divorced. Two years they are divorced. And the problems are not much. But there's no solution. Because we don't have the solution. They go to their pastor, he advises them, you know, just be patient, God, God will do it in the name of Jesus, you know. There's always going to be a way. Yeah, yeah, we know that. But they need to, have to know how to manage an in-law and manage finances and manage some incompatibility issues and all of that. And it takes somebody who understands the whole psychology of it to advise them. 
and we'll be there, the marriage will fail right before our eyes. Can we get pastors becoming that? Some of you, God has already called you into that, but you are afraid. You, 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 you are intimidated, so you're trying to be like somebody else. We need some serious Christian theologians because the faith is being challenged all the time. Scientists are they're challenging our faith. Sociologists, psychologists are challenging our faith. And our young people are confused. And we don't have Christian apologists. Because we all want to be the same thing. Start a little, we want to be bishop. Start a little, I want to be apostle. I mean, I see young pastors. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying God cannot call people apostles when they are young. Who am I? I can't say that. But uh, you look at a person, you, you say, I'm apostle so and so. You look at him and you just feel like, are you serious? <laughs> are you really you, you really think you are apostle? You really, from the depth of your heart, <laughs> just do a self, you, from your own heart, you really think you are an apostle? Seriously? I mean, if you truly, really believe you're apostle, then I have to really take you to a psychologist and psychiatrist because you are nowhere near apostle. You are not even a youth leader. You are not even a discipleship trainer. You don't even understand theology. But we pick up these big titles and because of that, the areas of need in the church are never ministered to. And if we continue like that, our churches will mushroom in large numbers, but the troubles in the church, they will give us head uh, to take. And if every pastor is sincere, you know that there are toothache problems in our churches. That we are not able to deal with. We have one side fit all solution putting the same plaster on every wound. So I came here today with a very simple challenge to those of us who say God has called us. What is your area of specialization? What can the church rely on you for? Apart from general ministry, is there something else that I can sit with you and, and take advice from you on? And that you won't badly advise me. Is there an area of ministry you can offer that I cannot offer? That I would look up to you for? There should be. There should be. I'm general overseer. If I'm overwhelmed, I should be able to call and say, Pastor Swiss, can I see you? This is what I'm hearing is happening in this segment among the marriages. What, what do you advise? How do we go about it? Then you can advise me. But if I call you and say, you know, Pastor, let me just go and pray about it and hear what the Lord is saying. I said, that one I can do. Hear what the Lord is saying. I can do. But I want you to come with your expertise. God called Moses, didn't he? We just heard it in the, in the, in the exhortation. He called Moses to build the tabernacle and the ark of the ark covenant. But Moses didn't have the expertise. If it was left to Moses, there will be no tabernacle built and there will be no ark built and there will be nothing. But God called Moses. And at the same time God called Moses, he says, I've called people who have things you don't have. Experts. And I'll anoint them for this special task. So when Moses has an instruction, he goes to Bezalel. And he says, listen, this is 
what I have. How do we do it? He says, we're going to cut it this way, we'll cut the stone this way, we'll weave the fabric this way, we'll dye it this way, we'll do it this way, and we can do what God is saying. And if you really look at it, Moses was not the one who built the tabernacle. It was these aspects who built the tabernacle and built the ark of the Lord for the presence of God to dwell amongst them. All I'm saying is, if I am the Moses, I cannot build it unless there are aspects who can make it happen. And I'm speaking to all the ICGC pastors first. Let's work together. Give me something I can work with. And please don't come and tell me you have a prophetic mantle. I don't want to hear that. If you have a keep it to yourself. I have a good one. You hear me? If I need to have clarity on something, I'll call him. I'll say, yeah, what do you think? You know, uh, what, what, uh, he'll come and say, Doc, you know, this, and I, I just, okay, I move on. I don't need two. One. <laughs> you two. When I call you, what will you come and tell me? You have to have, come to the table with something. Now, for those of you who are not ICGC, I don't have power over you. You are your own bosses. But be a specialist. Be a specialist somewhere. Solve a problem for the church. Solve a problem for the church. You know, when we were growing up, we had a, a group called Child Evangelism Fellowship, CEF. And Child Evangelism Fellowship had good news clubs all over, uh, at least in Accra, Tema. And they had these clubs, the young people went, and good news, good news, Christ died for me, good news, good news, if I believe, good news, good news I'm saved eternally, that's wonderful, extra good news. This is Child Evangelism Fellowship. And every Christian used Child Evangelism Fellowship's material to build a good news club to reach to young people. Unfortunately, Child Evangelism uh, Fellowship has not done too well. But if you look at it, if you want to build a children's church, where do you go for materials? Is there really an aspect in child ministry in Ghana if you want to build a youth ministry, where do you go for lessons to train your youth? Is there a really specialized youth ministry? No. If you want to build a marriage ministry, where do you go? Is there a really specialized marriage ministry? No. Can you imagine the church in Africa has grown big with no aspects? And it's an African problem. Because everybody is doing the same thing. Now, for those of you who are older pastors, I will excuse you. You are grown. And you may not be able to learn new things. But for those of you who are up and coming, 40 and below, 50 and below, in your 20s, don't be like the seniors who are just generalists. become an aspect. There must be something you know that makes the church better because you know it. Develop skills in these areas of specialization. Youth ministry, children's ministry, marriage ministry, music ministry, all of that. Church administration. Church administration is a whole area of study. It's not just an administrator who is a Christian and say, because he's uh, combining what I learned as an administrator and a Christian, I'm doing church administration. No. How to administer a church is a totally different way, uh, area of study. We don't have expertise there. Church government, we don't have expertise. The church is big, but no aspects. So that's the burden I'm laying on you. 
And for those of you who are not yet pastors, think of some of these areas to go into. Think of solving the pro real problems in the church. Study. Gain the expertise. Not everybody will be a great preacher in the pulpit. The pulpit is one. But everybody can contribute to the growth of the church. And, and my burden and my prayer uh, as we leave this conference is that uh, God will help us to raise experts like David who could go into an army where everybody is afraid of Goliath and because they have a special skill and they can combine it with the prophetic word of God, they're able to take out Goliath and solve a nation's problem. And, and may God help us to raise such men. Amen. <laughs>